Good evening, everyone. It takes a village to raise a child, amen? I have a little one up here, village, help me. <laughs> it's wonderful to be back in Miami. I'm so grateful um, to have a second opportunity to be here uh, to discuss something that's been very near and dear to my heart over the past three years, and that is Howardina Fendel. I know, amen for Howardina. I'm generally not a church person, so I don't know where the amen thing is coming from. Um, but so um, it opened in February. Uh, Naomi Beckwith uh, and I had really been meditating on Howardina Pendel for a number of reasons. First and foremost, that she has been a pioneer in so many um, in, in so many areas. I think oftentimes people really did not have a sense of who Howardina was, and therefore there was not so much recognition for her as an artist, um, as an advocate, and as a pioneer, not only in the uh, curatorial field. A lot of people didn't know that she was the first black curator at MoMA, uh, but she was in the late 1960s. Um, so we owe a great debt to her, uh, Naomi and I, even thinking as curators and what she had done for the field in terms of opening it up for uh, future generations. So we really wanted to have an opportunity to really show the breadth and depth of Howard Dana's work, not only over 20 years, but over a 50 year period. So what remains to be seen was the title because we were very keenly aware that Howard Dana is still working. Uh, even now, being born in 1943, in her 70s is still very much um, doing very labor intensive and, and very iconic work. So we're very pleased to have presented this work. It uh, was presented through the MCA Chicago. At the time when we worked on it, I was still working in Houston with the Contemporary Arts Museum. Uh, I have since left and transitioned uh, to become the Sydney and Francis Lewis Family Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art in Virginia with the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. So this project actually arced that transition, which was a very interesting process. Uh, but the MCA did um, lay down its commitment very early and was very steadfast. And I believe what was created was really a, a project um, that was a, a deep tribute to Howardina that will and should stand the test of time. So this is the catalog, and it is a very in-depth catalog uh, with not only uh, meditations on Howardina's work by myself and Naomi, but a few others, but also um, an anthology of her writings, which um, oftentimes people, again, wrapping your arms all the way around Howardina, uh, it's hard to believe that uh, she is truly a part of that greatest generation that can truly do all things and all things very well. This was the talk that we did at the advent of the uh, opening uh, for the exhibition in which, uh, and we actually, the first public conversation we had was right here in Miami at Miami Basel. I believe that was in 2015. December of 2015. So this was a continuation of what we call the road show, where we would just come and um, speak. And each and every time, it's such a revelation. Even at that conversation on the opening, uh, we were asking questions, and she was providing even new information. And Naomi and I just looked across at each other and said, this is impossible. We thought we knew everything. And truly, it remains to be seen what all uh, Howardina is still, still mining her own practice because these retrospectives give artists uh, an opportunity. It's, it's, it's a little daunting to look back 50 years upon your work. Some artists, I know there are a lot of you in the artist, um, audience uh, now who are just beginning uh, your practice, maybe 10 years into your practice, a decade. And it seems like a long time, but if you can multiply that by five and think about what it's like to look back on your work 50 years. Um, it is, it's truly an opportunity and it's bringing so much to the fore. So we start truly at the beginning. The other fact about Howardina is that she was the first African-American woman 
um, to be in Yale's graduate program and to graduate from Yale's graduate program. So this is the work she was doing very early on when she was at, in Boston, uh, at the University of Boston where she went and did her undergrad work. She was very keen in going to Yale because Albers was at Yale and um, the sense of using color, which is so, so strong in her work uh, after her graduate program, you can see why she gravitated to Yale. She quickly went from that figuration of self-portraiture to looking at the figure in a very abstract way. So it felt like a very beautiful and natural progression that she would go from figuration straight into abstraction. And here you could see that midpoint where the landscape and the figuration just starts to dissolve uh, into color, pure color. Bones and baseball are two things that are reoccurring in Howard Dina's work. The other thing we realized is that she works in modes um, over long arcs of time and with themes over large, long arcs of time. Uh, when people think about Howard Dina's activism, coming from abstraction into activism seems like a huge leap. Um, but in reality, that was always there. And she often recites in the use of those small chads, which we'll show uh, momentarily, that they were really reminiscent of her traveling with her family from Philadelphia to Kentucky, which is where her mother was from, and how they would always stop. If you've seen a green book, you would know there are only few places back in those days that you could stop. So there was one hamburger stand that they would always stop and uh, have lunch. And she always noticed the dot at the bottom of the root beer mug. And she finally said, Dad, what, why, why is there a dot at the bottom of the mug? And he said, oh, that's to let them know that this is only for colored people. This is black people can only drink out of this particular mug. And so when that Chad comes back into um, the work, it is used as a device. It's used almost as a pointillistic uh, moment. Uh, but it's also very much fraught with other ideas um, that are deeply rooted and eventually that, um, that, that politic comes into play. So you can see uh, emerging from Yale, she uh, graduates in 1967 and heads beelines to New York. And uh, in New York, she knows she wants to be an artist but also has to work to make a living. And um, finally found, lands a job assisting Lucy Lepard uh, at MoMA for a project that she was doing. So this brings in a whole new dimension about looking at the grid and feminizing the grid in a very interesting way. So Howardine is at Yale, but it's also a place where you have Al Held, uh, who's also at Yale at the time as faculty. It is the height of minimalism, this hyper-masculine, very geometric moment. And as a woman, finding one's place in that, making a mark in that, um, she was looking for ways as most um, this sort of um, abstract eccentricism, eccentricism, excuse me, that comes into play where people are slowly trying to um, uh, soften the hard edges, um, bringing new materials to bear. Uh, and here she uses color, but she also softens the circle. So rather than it being a circle, it becomes this elliptical space. But the grid is ever present. Here's what she calls, it's an untitled work, but its secondary name is called Soft Grid. Uh, and this is a beautiful work. When we were uh, mining all of the material for the exhibition, there's this beautiful photograph of Howardina with her mask on because she would spray paint uh, oftentimes those very early canvases. And uh, in the background, is this image. And we were like, where, where is this piece? So we were able to finally track it down in Detroit. Uh, mm -hmm. But it is a stunning work. And it is rolled canvas, purely rolled cra uh, canvas, which is held together with grommets. Um, oh, yes. Hello. <laughs> and this is done with metal sculpt. 
which is again the grid is present uh, and she is trying to maneuver between these worlds and she often talks about finding her place as being black a black woman working in abstraction you know where you're not quite running with a big oh here we are again uh, <laughs> you're not quite running with the big boys you're not really accepted downtown but because of the work you're doing and the inability for it to be legible at a time in the 1970s where as a black artist you were being placed to task to create images that are uplifting to the community when there is uh, a space where the work is not legible, it's not considered or deemed um, a valid mode of working. Um, well, I wouldn't say a valid mode of working, that, that would be uh, untrue, but not something that would be readily embraced. Um, so oftentimes, Howard Dina will talk about going uptown, going to the Studio Museum in Harlem and saying, I want to have my work shown, and them saying, that work is more suited to be presented downtown rather than uptown. So being really caught in that quagmire, so oftentimes people say, well, why is Howardina not so well known? I mean, this is part of the quagmire when you do talk about older black artists working in abstraction. That slippage uh, where you're not quite embraced by either community was very much at play. So this is some of the early works on paper uh, where the Chad starts to make its strong entrance. Um, there are a number of works that she did on wood paper that were stunning monochromatic pieces in which geometry comes into bear. But this is where she actually starts to use the Chad as an actual material. Before, she was basically taking large sheets of manila folder, if you will, and simply using a hole punch to punch it out, to use as templates for the paintings. Uh, Carl Solway, a very iconic and well-known dealer in Ohio, came to her studio and said, what's with all of these, these, these discarded Chad things? What are, what are these things? What, how many are there? What are you doing with these things? And she said, well, I actually, I don't use them at all. I just punch them out to create the templates for the paintings. And he said, well, why wouldn't you use it as raw material? And, and how many are here anyway? And so she said, I don't know. I think I'll count them. And so you can see the numbers start to, she said, the radiograph becomes my best friend. And if you've never seen a radiograph, it's a very, it's a pencil with a very, very fine point. And these are extraordinary in the sense that sometimes there are four, five numbers on each small chad, and they're fixed by hand. So labor becomes a very big part of the work. This is a bit of a close-up. And of course, they're not sequential, so. Um, but again, the grid is ever-present. And these are very interesting. So sometimes photography and documentation does a disservice. Oftentimes these uh, works are done and there are small pieces of thread that runs as a grid throughout them and it allows her to actually create a three-dimensional space using these pieces. So rather than them uh, being flat onto the paper as you saw in the previous image, they're actually hanging from thread. So they're glued to very fine uh, sewing thread, uh, very fine thread. And she talks oftentimes because she was a curator at MoMA. She said, you know, they give these fancy parties. I'm not being paid very much, so I'm actually making my clothes. So uh, the thread actually becomes quite handy and used um, both to uh, create clothing for herself, but then also in the artwork. They branch out a little more. And here she's using layers of um, of trace paper, so she's creating three-dimensionality with, with sheets of very fine um, tracing paper. So this is where we saw the soft grid. Uh, Howardina, uh, she was spray painting, so she had this mask, um, and she said, I became hypersensitive about my health after knowing what happened to Eva Hesse. Um, she was convinced that it was the materials um, and the, the lack of ventilation that was um, the culprit 
in her illness. And so she even speaks even today because she's been teaching for the past 40 years. She speaks very uh, forcefully to her students that they have to be very careful in utilizing materials in the studio, that one has to take very good care of their health. So when we saw this image, which was so fantastic, this is the first time we realized the soft grid existed. Uh, and she only did one uh, as an experiment. So this is uh, the templates, again, creating that pointillistic um, sensibility and aesthetic being brought to the canvas. You see she's spray painting through these small, fine holes, layers upon layers of paint onto the canvas. And I'm very happy to say this is in our collection at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. It is actually the first time where she's affixing the chad to the canvas itself. And this is in the collection of the MCA. At some point in um, the mid 1970s, the work comes off the stretcher and um, that moment of labor starts to meld into questions around women's work. You see here, uh, this is Dutch Wife Squared. These are all small tiles. Um, the chad becomes ever present. Um, it accumulates onto the surface. And there's also other non-traditional materials being brought to bear. There's talcum powder, there's glitter. Um, and she often talks about uh, the work having a whole olfactory dimension to it. So when you stood in front of it, you could smell perfume uh, from the, the paintings. Here the chad she's using, where she's leaving the chad just simply hanging from the, the, the structure. But again, you see early work from the 1970s, and then here's 2003. So that's notion of working again in long arcs, modalities working and being produced, work being produced on long arcs of time. Coming full circle and sometimes what she calls a spiral um, back to the work as it continues to evolve. One of the amazing things, and when I first came to Howard Dina's work, it was with this body of work called the video drawings. I knew she was a painter, but I was less uh, familiar with the paintings than I was with her conceptual framing of work, and that was in the early 1970s with a series called Video Drawings. Again, work that she continues to do to this very day. When I asked her how does she arrive at this mode of working, she often talks about the intensity of labor and uh, using the, um, the chads and gluing them that uh, when she went to the doctor about her eyesight, he was saying that she needed to vary her way of seeing so that instead of only looking closely and finally for long periods of time, she needed to look up and, and, and give the eye the ability to see at a distance, uh, objects at a distance. So she said, I bought a small television set so that when I was sitting at a table working, I could look up and allow my eyes to focus for distance. And in doing so, she said, I often didn't care what was on television because I wasn't interested in it. I, uh, it would often be these random um, television shows and, the things of, and, and things of that nature. She said, but then I started reading this book called The Tao of Physics and thinking about, because um, astronomy becomes a sort of secondary mode for her. So when you see those chats, they even over time take on other dimensions in terms of meaning for her. But at that point, she was really looking at the physics of how air, things move all around us. And is there a way to actually denote that movement, the things that we don't see, the intangible things? around us and the physics of space and energy. So she got an idea of just simply making these vector marks onto acetate. And because of the static electricity, they would stick right onto the surface of the television. 
So these became a mode of chance operations for her. She had a, a remote clicker and would just simply look up and if the image seemed right point, she would just take the photograph. And these became a beautiful series of works, um, again, under the rubric of video drawing. Sports, she found, were actually the most interesting and successful. And then science fiction. So oftentimes if she would travel, and she traveled extensively, um, or she would just turn it to the sci-fi channel, or if there was a, a special on science fiction movies, she would just keep it affixed and, and photograph from there. So the interesting thing about Howardina working in the time that she was working and in the modes that she was working, not only as an artist but as a curator, it's a very interesting times in the States. And unfortunately, some issues are still very pervasive, particularly in the cultural landscape as well. Uh, it was at a time where um, you had very little representation in terms of um, people of color being in mainstream institutions, and yet these institutions were very much interested in presenting exhibitions on the cultural history and production of artists of color. So therein lies the schism. Um, so needless to say, when the Whitney, well, it started with Harlem on my mind, became a flashpoint for um, the community really taking institutions to task of doing a better job in representing who they truly were. And part and parcel with that was to actually have individuals on staff who had some experience, some background in which to draw from in, in, in making those exhibitions more organic and more authentic. So Harlem on my mind, of course, sets the framework for what would become future protests. Um, the Whitney's Museum, um, um, Contemporary Black Artists in America also becomes a flashpoint because while they are good and well-intentioned, there are no black um, advisors or curators involved in that project. So many artists uh, began to protest. And here's Howardina at the MoMA in a position again trying to negotiate uh, how to fit this sense of activism from within the institution, also as an artist from outside of the institution. So we talk about 1979 as really being a pivotal moment in Howardina's life and a pivotal moment in her work. What happens in 1979, and I'll just leave it at that, um, there is an exhibition at Artist Space. Um, David Newman is the artist, and he entitles the exhibition Nigger Drawings. So Howardina is a curator of prints and illuminated manuscripts, and of course she has some ideas and some responses to this exhibition, uh, which she takes to the streets, along with other colleagues, scholars, writers, curators, other artists, protest at Artist Space about this exhibition, the needless you know, uh, provocation for a title in which the content of the work does not even speak to the certain usage of nigger. So why, why, why utilize the word? So through the protests and in her position at MoMA, she was actually taken to task because uh, they felt that she was creating a space of um, hostility toward an artist that she was evoking a sense of censorship onto this artist. And understanding that that became her own personal crossroads, she decided to quit MoMA. And David Cuspit um, offers her a job, Donald Cuspit, excuse me, offers her a job teaching. So she starts to teach at SUNY Stony Brook, where she continues to teach today. While they are driving there, there were in a Volkswagen Beetle, and they were hit broadside by what she calls a, a huge car, like a Cadillac, driven by a nun, she says. So she felt that it was an act of God, the fact that she had gotten into this car accident, which um, 
she sustained a head injury from this car accident. And uh, because of that head injury, um, some short-term memory loss, um, an inability to uh, focus for long periods of time, and as an artist, working as an artist and now teaching, these were things that could have been um, um, factors to end her career. So she worked very hard at reframing herself, remembering things, and where she tried so hard to really create a subtlety in, in terms of her work uh, and where she placed herself in her work. Abstraction was, in her way, a legitimate way of working in which her body did not have to be present, and therefore it became a mechanism or a strategy to sort of sidestep some of the more um, um, slippery slopes in the art world, where the black body didn't have to be present if you were doing abstraction you could potentially just sort of squeeze through. And so she was very aware that that was a strategy that she was doing. And here was a, an action on her body in which she needed now to utilize her body to remember exactly who she was, literally stitching her memories back together again. So, and in doing that, she decided to not only bring the figure back into her work, but to assert her own self into the work. So um, memory tests, she starts to do works, uh, small works at first and then larger scale works, but then her body and her own personal figure uh, looms large in the work um, that starts an autobiography series. Prior to that, she does one of the only videos that we were aware of, a video entitled Free White and 21 in which she recounts all these moments of discrimination that she has endured. And not only uh, for herself, but for her mother, that there is this sort of generational slights that are recounted as part of family lore. And she felt it strongly coming out of graduate school, attempting to have a career as a black female artist, um, that, that this became her um, way of finding her voice, as she says. And Brian Wallace really brings that beautifully to bear in the catalog itself, that this is the moment that Howard Dina finds her voice as an activist. Um, prior to that, she is working as a feminist. She helps to find, found uh, the Air Gallery in New York, which is uh, an all-women's gallery that still is very much at play today. Um, so her space as a female Jane Crow concept is very much at present, but the melding of these things come together um, in Free White in 21. Memory past, again, this is all working through her recovery uh, from the accident. So she travels extensively in her position at MoMA. She travels extensively. She travels extensively because her family traveled. Uh, and she has these moments of she has these moments uh, where she begins to utilize the postcards, the photographs, um, again, in the service of her remembering, but also as source material. So she begins to create these beautiful bodies of work. Um, there's a whole section of the exhibition in which we explore Howardina um, as, as traveler. And she talks oftentimes about traveling allowed her to sort of escape the pathology of racism of America. Being in a black female body in other parts of the world, how other people saw her gave her other dimensions of how she could see herself. So these are other modes in which she's taking postcards and photographs and literally stitching or exploding or dissolving the landscapes uh, of places that she's visited. And what's really beautiful, and again, this is where documentary photography escapes us. If you were in, in front of that work, you would see that in the breaks where she's literally glued these pieces together, she has painted. So their painting comes into this as well. <laughs> 
She does a whole series, again, autobiography. And her figure, here we go, she's literally laying her body onto the canvas and tracing her body. Scapegoat. This is a young photograph of herself. as well as a photograph of her in the 90s. Jim Crow, Art Crow. So here she begins writing and doing meditations on mainstream institutions. How often does representation and diversity happen within those institutions through programming, through exhibitions? She's use, utilizing the video drawing mode um, to really take on the issues of the day. Um, and she was liking Vietnam to what was happening with the uh, conflict in the Middle East. Again, separate but equal. So really looking at it in terms of the AIDS pandemic. This is, again, separate but equal, taking on the AIDS pandemic, and names of children and women who had died from AIDS. Looking back at her own histories. And again, the figure of the skeleton coming back into play. The vectors. And this is where the astronomy comes in. So there's a whole exploration of Howardina Pendelis, the scientist, because she's very much engaged in looking at the heavens and notions of time and space and how those things become collapsed when you think the sunlight that we feel today was sent, what, I don't know how many years prior. And here, finally, video drawings for the weather, which is where we see them oftentimes, these vectors. But in the aftermath of Katrina. And here, she says, and she says, and Valerie, the most incredible thing is that the hole punch as a mechanism has evolved over all these years. So no longer do you have these little small chads. She can use the hole punch to create a variety of shapes, even elliptical shapes. So this is what the work looks like more recently. And this was from her uh, 2016 exhibition at Garth Grennan. And you could see the varying sizes of the holes, the chads that she's creating now and moving away from the grid, that the spiral is what comes into play. Still being stitched, still hand and very labor intensive. And that's it, I didn't bring any images of the actual installation, but I would encourage you to come to Richmond if you can. Uh, it will be on view from August 25th through the end of November. So a long stretch, and I hope you do come for visiting. Thank you for having me. I'll entertain any questions.